World War III almost began. And it was involved in the flyover of large numbers of circular metallic craft, flying in formations, very obviously under intelligent control. And they would fly out of the Soviet sector in the Warsaw Pact toward the West, in formation, at a high rate of speed, at a very high altitude. And they would turn north over the English Channel, over the southern coast of England, and then they would disappear off of NATO radar over the Norwegian Sea. In September 1967, Steckling himself had a spectacular UFO sighting. In 1967, my father, mother and I were on lecture tour in Germany and we were traveling from Mannheim on the train and we witnessed along with the passengers on board this train a armada of what we would call spacecraft or UFOs appearing and disappearing above the train I'd say around 10,000 feet and my father with his 8 millimeter camera filmed the sequence of these craft and as the film rolls you can see the crafts appear and disappear in formation and you can see the motion of the trees moving by as the train is in motion so the craft are behind the trees not in front of it <coughs> and um, it was quite an interesting piece of film. Uh, it was reported in the newspaper the next day, the German newspaper for that particular area. On our way back from Schifferstadt to Frankfurt, we were able to film a whole amount of space car flying over, I would say, very close to the, and very near to the Frankfurt airport. This film and all of Mr. Adamski's film we took as we returned to Washington, D.C. and my husband Lord led us to NASA, to the Pentagon and offered them the chance to look upon the films which were available. We got invited to all of the organization, to the Pentagon, we got invited to NASA, and during, during the conversation that we held with NASA, we had 22 scientists present, and none of these scientists ridiculed what we had. In fact, they were not even interested in the skull cast because they told us the size of it, how they fly, and with what they fly. Well, that morning of the 2nd of February, 1961, World War III almost began. The Soviets went on red alert. The NATO forces went on red alert. Everybody was, you know, fingers on their triggers thumbs poised above those red buttons. And it, World War III was just an awful story. Within 20 minutes, it was all over. The objects flew, turned north, disappeared off the radar. It was all over. After this event occurred, a British air marshal by the name of Sir Thomas Pott who was a deputy supreme allied commander in Europe at that time. He was a deputy to my boss, General Lyman Lendeser, an American four-star general, who was known as SACUR, supreme allied commander in Europe. Air Marshal Pike says, I've had enough of this. These objects have been showing up regularly from time to time. And I said, they almost triggered a war. Air Marshal Pike said, we're going to have to come to terms and find out what the hell's going on here. I want to know. So he began a study. He initiated a study in shape headquarters that was to last three years. They published it 
and they issued it in the summer of 1964 while I was there working in the war room. They titled it an assessment, an evaluation of a possible military threat to allied forces in Europe. It's all it had from them, I you know, just couldn't for, learn very much about that. An assessment, an evaluation of a possible military threat to allied forces in Europe. I was working in the war room one early morning around 2 or 3 o'clock, and as I jokingly used to refer to it, the coffee was too black to drink. We read all the newspapers, magazines. Many of you have heard military life is about 99% boredom, broken up with 1% of sheer terror. And that's the way it used to be, and that's the way it probably is used today. I'm sitting there nodding off, and this American Air Force full colonel looked at me, and he says, wake up. He went over to the vault. The vault, the shock, was a walk-in safe. We opened the door and walked in, and we kept classified documents in there. The colonel went over to the vault, the file, and pulled out this document and threw it on my desk, and he says, read that, that'll wake you up. Ladies and gentlemen, my life changed. I opened the first page and I couldn't put it down. I read and read and read, and I read it every time I was on duty in the war room. I was shocked, I was stunned by the implications of what I read in that study. <clears throat> and as I said, my life has never been ever quite the same. The study, briefly, and I have to brief, briefly lay this out. I could talk to, for two hours about this, but the study simply concluded this. Is there a threat to Allied forces in Europe? Apparently not. They concluded that the planet Earth and the human race had been under some kind of survey or observation going on for hundreds, if not thousands of years. They concluded in 1964 that there were at least four different groups coming here, observing us, surveying us, analyzing us, closely watching us, what we were up to, what we were doing. They concluded that there did not appear to be a military threat involved because the repeated demonstrations of incredibly advanced technology demonstrated to us that if they had been hostile or malevolent, there was absolutely nothing we could do. If they were evil in their intent and they were hostile toward us, it would have been over a long time ago. So, the conclusion was there were four different groups involved. They had been coming here for a very, very long time. Apparently, they were not malevolent or hostile. The question was, what the hell are they doing here? Why are they here? And why are they interested in us? Well, they did not know in 1964 what their agenda or their motives were. And I will tell you honestly and frankly that even today, our authorities, our senior military, our national security people, still don't totally grasp what their motives are. 